In this video, what I'd like to do is talk about financial contracts as they're described in a DSL. So we're thinking just about the financial contracts, not about yet, about how they run on blockchain. So I'll introduce this language, and then in a subsequent video, we'll look at how it has to be adapted if we want to make it run on blockchain. OK, let's get started. Well, one of the reasons that we wanted to look at financial contracts on blockchain was that there's a substantial amount of work really in the last two decades that's gone on into looking at how contracts can be described using domain-specific languages. One of the first pieces of work was by Simon Peyton Jones and Jean-Marc Hébert and Julian Seward from um, academics and uh, industrialists working in this area. And what we've done, what I'll do now, is show you um, a, a, a variant on what they did and the sorts of things that we need to express in a financial contract language. The contract we're thinking about here is what's called an escrow contract. Um, we, Alice wants to buy a cat from Bob. You can see there, Alice has the, cat, the money, Bob has the cat, but neither of them trusts each other. So you can imagine the situation. Alice puts the money in and Bob doesn't give her a cat, so she loses her money. Bob hands the cat over to Alice and she doesn't pay him, so he loses his cat. How can they ensure, when there's a lack of trust, that they um, the contract is executed properly? Well, the answer here is that we have a three-person contract involving a trusted mutual friend. So Alice knows Carol, Bob knows Carol, and both Alice and Bob trust Carol. So we can write a contract that will ensure that either the cat gets transferred and the money transferred or neither. So let's see how this works. Alice first puts the money into the contract and then um, we wait to see whether Bob transfers the cat to her. And Alice and Bob at this point are then asked, do you, do you agree that you've both um, that you've both made the transfer? In the case that they do, um, the money can be released and um, transferred to Bob. So if both Alice and Bob agree in that situation, there's no problem. But backtracking, Suppose Alice puts the money in and she waits. She waits for the, the cat, but she doesn't receive the cat. So she doesn't want to make the payment. Bob does want to receive the money, so they disagree. She doesn't want to release the money, he does. So what happens? What happens now is that Carol will intervene and Carol will say, oh, well, I can see that in this situation, Alice wants the money back, and that's the right thing. She should get her money back. So in this case, Carol makes that decision, and the money can be released back to Alice. So what are we seeing here? We see money being deposited in a contract. We see payments being made. We see choices being made um, by multiple participants. So let's see how those look in a, an example contract. So here we can see one way that we could write this contract. And it says, um, when waits for Alice to make a choice, when makes for Bob to make a choice. And then it says, if what Alice has chosen is the same as what Bob has chosen, we do what they've agreed on. Otherwise, we have to arbitrate. So we've got here, um, and what I've done is, is in, in the... In the first version you saw, I'm saying there's this contract agreement. We can expand that to see what it says. Um, what it says is if Alice has chosen to make the payment, then we make a payment from Alice to the party Bob of the price. Um, and if Alice hasn't chosen to make a payment, then the contract just is just closed because nothing. Nothing will happen, and any money that remains in the contract will be returned 
In this case, the money will be returned to Alice. So here we've got our contract. And these, you can see the things that are illustrated in here in pink. These are the, the um, constituent parts, the combinators that the, the contract is made up of. So with a when, we wait for something to happen. With an if, we check. Does a particular condition hold? If it does, we do one thing. If it doesn't, we do something else. And one of the things we might, we, we often do, is we make a payment. Um, and then we have a point where the contract is closed and some money may, may be left in the contract. And so that money gets refunded to the people who'd um, originally put it in. So there we've got our escrow contract in, um, in overview. So just to run through in a bit more detail what each of these things does. The when waits for something to happen, in this case, a choice from Alice. And when that choice has happened, it does um, what the rest of the contract says it should. In this case, we have an if. We check, has the choice that Alice made be to make a payment? If it is, the payment goes from Alice to Bob. If not, we, we close the contract. And as I said, the final thing we see here is that right at the heart of these things are payments being made from one person to another. So there we have, in essence, what um, our financial contract language does. What we'll do next is take a look at, step back a bit and say, well, how, how might we have to adapt this when we move into the, the world of blockchain? What might be different?